Good afternoon. I'm Judy Woodward, the History Coordinator of the Ramsey County Library, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to this fourth talk in J.B. Anderson's series, John Adams, A New Look at Our Second President. Our topic today has changed a little bit from what was available uh, in our uh, program guide. Um, JB will be discussing John Adams' presidency instead of the original topic, uh, his ambassadorship. Today's speaker, historian J.B. Anderson, has long been very popular with our history audiences. His ongoing series of programs on the U.S. presidents uh, are some of the best attended history events that we've experienced. J.B.'s appearance today is made possible through the co-sponsorship of the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute of the University of Minnesota with financial support from Ramsey County Library Friends Organization. We are deeply grateful to both these organizations. Thank you very much. And now I'd like to turn things over to our speaker, J.B. Anderson, for this talk on John Adams and the presidency. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I'll get set up here. So the Adams presidency is what we're uh, going to talk about today. Uh, it was four years, 1797 to 1801. Common mistake uh, made by uh, many people, authors included, is they'll say Adams was president 1796 to 1800. Those are actually the years of the elections. Uh, and, but the president does not take office today until the next January. So it's 1797 when they actually take office. In Adams's day, you didn't take office until March following the November elections. Took you that long to get to Washington, D.C. from your home state. Um, first thing we're going to do is to talk about some criticism. Uh, Jefferson was an opponent to Adams. Uh, Adams was a Federalist. Jefferson was in the Democratic Party. Uh, its name uh, at this time, in the late 1700s, was the Democratic Republican Party, but they dropped uh, that uh, Republican part of the title. So uh, Adams wants a very strong uh, federal government. This is something that Jefferson is opposed to. Uh, the major reason is a strong federal government might end slavery. So the Southern states were very much opposed to Adams and a Federalist and a man from Massachusetts, a free state, uh, being in the presidency worried about his development of a strong federal government and what would that do to slavery. Uh, another Federalist, uh, in addition to Adams, that's a very famous one, is Alexander Hamilton. And there's uh, several things that they uh, uh, were involved with. Uh, one was the Alien and Sedition Acts, which were passed during the Adams administration. Uh, and they were very anti-free speech. We're going to talk about them in much greater depth later on. Uh, they also were uh, concerned about uh, ship piracies and, and uh, other countries that were to the north of us, Britain and France to the south of us, Spain, and throughout the Caribbean many European countries. And, and we uh, came very close to a war with France under Adams. So we'll uh, take a look at those items also. Uh, slavery and the two-term limit we're going to talk about. Uh, the first 12 presidents, only John Adams and his son, John Quincy Adams, did not own slaves. So 10 of the first 12 presidents were slave owners. And uh, here's a photograph taken of a plantation uh, 
uh, head, uh, the head female on the plantation with a couple of her servants. Uh, those working in the homes were professionally dressed, such as you see these uh, two gentlemen here. Those working in the fields were uh, dressed for uh, agricultural work. Of the first seven presidents, Adams and his son, John Quincy Adams, were the only ones to serve a single term. Uh, of the first seven presidents, uh, they all served, the five of the seven served uh, two terms. Uh, and there are the uh, only two presidents to uh, uh, at this time uh, to have lost a re-election bid. They ran for second terms, but they lost. So they were our only two first term presidents. Uh, when I was looking for a one term graphic, uh, I found this. And it was Donald Trump who served one term, but it, it referred to him as one termite. Uh. Scandal free administration. Uh, not really. Let's take a look at that. Adams uh, has been uh, ranked uh, the uh, Schlesinger father and son, both historians. A junior was an advisor to John F. Kennedy in the 1960s. Uh, these two gentlemen uh, started evaluations of presidents, and they did them randomly, sometimes two years apart, sometimes 10 years apart. Uh, when the second Schlesinger, uh, Schlesinger Jr. died, Siena College uh, took over the ranking of presidents, and they do it every seven years. Now, the highest rank Adams has ever received is 10th, and that was in 1982. And at that time, there were, I think, maybe 41 presidents or so. So, so being in the top 10. Now, uh, in the 2010 uh, survey, uh, he placed 17th, and there's been 45 different presidents. Uh, Biden is called number 46, but that's because uh, Grover Cleveland served two non-consecutive terms, so we count him twice. He's the 23rd and 24th president. So 17th out of 45 places uh, Adams in 2010, well into the upper half, uh, almost into the top third of presidents. Uh, free of scandals, uh, three scandal-free accomplishments that occurred during the Adams administration. Uh, there were lots of arguments, but um, a lot of the stuff wasn't really scandalous. Much of it, uh, when we look at it, you, I think you could say it certainly was. Uh, another, so no scandals is one item. Another scandal item is um, no political patronage. Adams uh, was interested only in making appointments based on merit. Uh, in, in other words, it wasn't, uh, uh, if I appoint you to this and such, what am I gonna get out of it? Or the appointee saying, I would love to serve in your administration, but what can you do for me? beyond that or in addition to that, et cetera. Uh, Adams uh, very seldom interviewed uh, people that he was considering for positions. Rather, he looked at their record and then did the appointments. Uh, office seekers, uh, that's, that's the third reason that I've just mentioned. No hearings. Uh, office seekers were based on merit. Uh, cabinet members, a uh, picture of a China cabinet there, but of course that's not what we mean. We mean the people who are close advisors and heads of departments within the administrative branch of government. Uh, Adams had uh, five cabinet members. Three of them had been 
in Washington's cabinet. Now, uh, a lot of people argue that Washington was a federalist. I happen to think this is the case, but um, uh, why, why would uh, Adams have this continuation? Uh, one thing, it uh, leads to a smooth transition from one presidency to another. Uh, you've got three people that were in the cabinet of five under Washington. They can tell you a good deal about what was going on. Now, Adams was vice president under Washington, but he was given uh, no power. Uh, he wasn't included in uh, any decisions. Uh, really an outlander, outlier. Uh, so he didn't know much about what had happened during the Washington administration. Also, uh, you bring in three people from the previous president, and that's uh, less appointments, and uh, that can mean less conflicts, since each of these cabinet appointees has to be approved by the United States Senate. and. Uh, Another reason that uh, he just continued uh, three of these five uh, cabinet members was uh, uh, couldn't be accused of uh, people buying a position in the cabinet. Today, there are 16 cabinet positions. So Adams uh, had conflicts with Hamilton, even though they were both in the same party. They were both uh, Federalists. Uh, the graphic here is a uh, one of the most famous uh, uh, biographies of Alexander Hamilton by Ron Chernow. Uh, you can order it through any bookstore, but it's also available uh, through uh, Amazon online. Uh, Hamilton was uh, not a part of the Adams administration, uh, even though they shared a lot of the same opinions. But um, Hamilton did a lot of discussing and talking and communicating with uh, John Adams' cabinet members. So he was an important element in the administration, even though not directly with Adams. Uh, the XYZ affair is the next thing that we're going to talk about during the Adams presidency. And uh, it, uh, it involves uh, foreign affairs, and they are with France. First, let's take a look at the diplomats who were involved in this XYZ affair. It, uh, as I'd stated, it was a diplomatic problem with France. And uh, the, French, the three French agents that were involved wanted to remain anonymous. Consequently, uh, this situation during the Adams administration is referred to as the XYZ affair. But of course, today we know who these guys are. Talk about that in a minute. So uh, the United States sends diplomats to France. Uh, problems had arisen with France. Um, there was a French Revolution uh, going on during the Adams administration, and it started four years earlier in 1792. And um, uh, most of the Federalists were very happy to see a monarchy overthrown. Uh, but many in the US, including Federalists, wanted to uh, steer clear of being involved in the French Revolution. Part of this was because the uh, Democrats supported the French Revolution very heavily. And there were also economic concerns. Uh, France what, didn't do a lot for other countries economically, nothing like Britain did. Uh, Jefferson was, uh, was opposed to uh, uh, this relationships with France when they had a monarchy. The reason was he was opposed to monarchies. He wanted democracies. Here's X, Y, and Z, the French agents. Uh, number one is uh, John Conrad Hottinger. Uh, number two on the lower left, Pierre Bellamy. 
and Lucien Hadaval is number three. And these were the French diplomats that uh, were involved in the XYZ affair. The United States commissioners who were involved in this situation and communicating with the three French officials was Charles Pickney, number one there. He uh, had been uh, governor of South Carolina. And then John Marshall, number two, he was secretary of state under Adams, would eventually be appointed as the fourth chief justice of the United States and the longest serving one. And he's the guy that came up with the idea that um, laws passed by Congress can be overturned by the Supreme Court if they are unconstitutional in nature. And item number three, uh, or person number three is Elbridge Jerry. Uh, he'd been a vice president of the United States. He'd also been a governor and uh, gerrymandering is named for him. Setting up congressional districts so that your political party can win. Uh, let's take a look at some current gerrymandering. Uh, you know, one of the things I always like to tell people is uh, compare his historical events to things that are going on today. Gerrymandering is still a common situation. How many districts today in the United States are gerrymandered? We have 435 districts. Each gets one member in Congress. So the House of Representatives has 435 members, approximately 100 districts, about a fourth of all congressional districts are gerrymandered and about 80 of them are in favor of Republican candidates. Uh, here are some gerrymandered districts. Number one on the left, look at the shape of that thing. Uh, that's the third district in Maryland. Texas is 33rd district. And look at Illinois's fourth district on the right upper. Lower left, Texas's 35th district. And on the lower right, Louisiana's second district. These are some crazy looking configurations. Uh, what people may try to do is you get all, uh, you're in a Republican state. So you want all the Democrats to be in a single district. So you draw goofy lines like this then they're not voting in three districts. The Democrats are almost all voting in a single district or vice versa. Uh, here's a Pennsylvania seventh district. Uh, if you look very carefully, you can see it's uh, not contiguous. It's two separate units. Here is another non-contiguous district. This is in North Carolina. Uh, and you can see uh, all along a river there uh, on the left is a part of a district that is quite um, uh, misshapen there on your right. Uh, and blue are Democratic Party districts. Red are uh, Republican districts. So you can see the, the Democrats here have quite obviously been included in a single district. Uh, Florida, here's a long district that stretches in the south from Orlando, Florida to Jacksonville in the north. And you can see it has quite a winding path and in the northern section, quite narrow at, at one point. So that's the end of the contemporary side note about gerrymandering. <coughs> the first demand <coughs> that was made by the French is we want money. We're not gonna negotiate with you guys until you pay us something. Well, this was very upsetting. <coughs> excuse me, to those three uh, United States representatives 
uh, now in France, hoping to negotiate. And uh, news of this got out and the population of the United States became very upset about it, that uh, another country wanted money before they'd negotiate with us. <coughs> this uh, demand for payment came from this man, Charles Talleyrand. He was a French foreign minister and a Catholic clergyman. Uh, Talleyrand was uh, uh, long live the king when there was a king in power. Then when Napoleon comes to power, it's long live the emperor because uh, Napoleon had conquered so much territory. Difference between a king is he's in a single country. An emperor is somebody with lots of conquered territory. And uh, when the French Revolution was playing out, it was uh, long live the Republic. So Talleyrand, he went along with whatever happened to be going on at the time. Uh, XYZ affair, let's take a look at the, the French Revolution and its effect on this uh, situation. French Revolution is going on when this XYZ affair occurs. So there's um, uh, all this internal trouble in France. And anytime a country starts having problems internally, uh, the neighbors start looking at it and they say, uh, they're fighting among themselves. This would be a good time to attack that country. And that's, uh, that's what Britain did. You know, let's uh, send troops in there. They're fighting each other. Now they're going to have to fight us also. And maybe we can take over that country or major portions of it. Uh, also in the Caribbean, I'll show you a larger picture of that map on the next slide. But uh, in the Caribbean, the British and the French uh, controlled lots of the islands in the Caribbean Sea. Uh, and the U.S. wanted a treaty that dealt with some of this. That's what the XYZ affair was uh, going to be about. And there was lots of piracy in that area. And the United States wanted that stopped also and felt that France could be able to do that. So here's a uh, long ways from Europe, but you can see in the, uh, uh, here as you can see Florida. So the United States is uh, shipping, doing a lot of shipping across this area. And so there's concerns about uh, piracy, uh, about uh, international waters and can we sail through waters that the French consider theirs and the British, same situation. Uh, the W affair, this is uh, uh, kind of a side note here about uh, something else that arose during this time. It's been called an affair within an affair. W was Nicholas Hubbard. I couldn't find a photograph of him. But um, here's his uh, tombstone, and you can see he lived uh, uh, lived to be almost ninety years old. Uh, he was an Englishman. Uh, Hubbard was, but he was working for a Dutch bank, and he aided in the arrangement of this meeting between the French and the U.S. and. Uh, he arranged this meeting between just two of the agents, uh, Jan Hodinger, who was the Frenchman, and Charles Pickney, who was one of the three U.S. Uh, representatives. So they agreed to meet. Hodinger told uh, Pickney that uh, now uh, we don't just want a payment, we want a $50,000 loan and uh, Hubbard will make this loan from the Dutch bank that he works at, and, uh, and then we'll start talking to you. So this will it'll just be like a loan that you can pay back, but you have to give us the 50 grand up front. So, and uh, payment then is going to be made to Talleyrand, 
uh, shown here in uh, in his uh, clerical uh, gear, uh, clergyman and diplomat. Uh, Talleyrand uh, will then, this is what these two gentlemen are saying. The French says, we get the 50 grand, we'll stop ship, ship seizures in the Caribbean. French ships taking over U.S. ships. Uh, the U.S. didn't have much of a navy, but they did have um, uh, lots of private uh, ships, privately owned corporate ships. Uh, U.S. diplomats refuse this deal. They say, no, uh, no thanks. We're not going to pay a 50 grand to have uh, these ship, ship seizures stopped. Uh, the American commissioners then separate. Let's take a look at that. Uh, Pickney uh, continues saying, uh, we want to meet with Telegram. Let's do it informally. Let's not talk about money anymore. Albridge Jerry and John Marshall are opposed to meetings of any kind because of these uh, criteria that have been set involving money. And both Jerry and uh, Marshall say, we're going back home to the United States. This thing is over. Uh, so Talleyrand contacted uh, Jerry and told him, uh, if you guys leave France, uh, we're going to declare war on the United States. Uh, Jerry uh, then writes to John Adams and says, I want to come home. He gets a letter back from Adams that says, OK, come on home. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll see if their threat holds any water or not. Well, Adams, as president and Congress, now respond to these difficulties with France. Uh, Adams knew about the attempted bribery. He'd been told by the uh, U.S. agents in France, and uh, he discusses it with his cabinet. Now, his cabinet, he's the president. Thomas Jefferson is the vice president. But uh, Adams and Jefferson don't get along. President and vice president are elected separately. It's not two people from the same party necessarily. And that's what happened here in the 1796 election. Adams, a Federalist, is elected president. But elected vice president is a Democrat, Thomas Jefferson. And then his uh, cabinet, you can see he's got a Secretary of State, Secretary of the Treasury, Secretary of War, an Attorney General, and a Secretary of the Navy. So two of these uh, five positions are military in nature. So Adams meets with his cabinet, and the cabinet comes up with three items. We're worried about war as a result of this XYZ affair. So uh, let's build up our troops. Uh, we didn't maintain a standing army very much up until after World War II. Uh, so uh, that was seen as a necessary thing uh, due to the possible threat of war here, or the threat of war and possible warfare. So uh, Congress and Adams uh, increase the U.S. military to 20,000 members. Uh, they want to add more ships to the Navy. The United States Navy is very small. Uh, there's lots of ships coming out of the United States, but they're mostly privately owned, and they're not uh, armed like military uh, ships would be. And third, uh, three cabinet members come out, state they're very hostile toward the French, and they think that we should declare war on the French. So you got three of the five cabinet members saying, uh, warfare, please. Well, uh, Congress reacts to all of this now, uh, and there's four major items. One is 
we're going to build 12 additional naval ships. And that's quite a bit. I think there were only five at the time. So this is, uh, uh, all, you know, more than doubles the uh, size, uh, triples the size of the United States Navy. And increase troop size, no more small bananas. We want lots of soldiers and uh, that had happened. Uh, then there was a Treaty of Alliance in 1778. This is when we were under the Articles of Confederation in the United States. And uh, France had aided us in our war. They sent us their uh, equivalent to their general, Lafayette. And so France has uh, 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 been very helpful during the American Revolution. And so in 1778, we set up this alliance with the French. And um, uh, what do we do now about that? Here we're having all this trouble with France. And yet we have this uh, treaty of alliance that they're our best friend. Uh, so it becomes a black hole. What do we do? Uh, finally, what's decided is we're just simply not going to aid France in any way. So the United States says also Congress says we need to start attacking French ships of war, especially when they come near us or, or uh, get too close to our shores. Or they don't stay in international waters, et cetera. Reaction in France to this XYZ affair. Well, Talleyrand, uh, who's the big, he, he's the big foreign diplomat for, for France and a clergyman. And uh, he st it starts looking like he's in trouble. Uh, the French people are going, we're you losing the United States as an ally. So Talleyrand says, uh, I had nothing to do with contacting these uh, uh, diplomats from the United States. Uh, I didn't ask for any payments. I didn't ask for bribes. Uh, don't look at me about the, uh, this issue. Uh, here's a quote from Talleyrand. It says, uh, wherever there is trouble, look for a priest. And he himself, of course, is a priest. And that became a very famous uh, quote as a result. Here's Elbridge Jerry. Uh, he states that, uh, that uh, Talleyrand was very much involved in these uh, negotiations and demands for money and so forth. And, that he was really the guy that told these French agents to get money out of the United States. Now, everybody starts becoming concerned. And this leads to what in US history is called the Quasi War. And that's our next uh, topic. Uh, let's, let's define this. What is quasi? Quasi has uh, several meanings, almost, so it's an almost war, a seemingly war, or a false war. So it's fake. It did have some fighting in it, but uh, not enough to, you really can't call it a war. So it was given this term quasi, meaning fake or false war took place mostly in the Caribbean, so it was in the New World and south of the U.S. And here on this map, I have drawn a circle around the Caribbean Sea. Uh, constitutional issue we're going to talk about for the quasi-war, and that's, it's an undeclared war. Uh, you know, Congress has the power to declare war. Presidents throughout most of our history have gone to Congress and said, I want a declaration of war. Well, the last time we did that was 1941, when uh, Franklin Roosevelt went to Congress and wanted war declared against Japan. Uh, 
most famous undeclared wars, here's just a few listed, Korea, Vietnam, Gulf War, Iran, Iraq, Afghanistan. But let's take a look. Here are, uh, here's, a, I think there's 11 on this page. Here's another 10 uh, since um, uh, World War II's declaration of war. I'm going back to this slide here. You can see there's lots of little conflicts and minor invasions. Here's a second. There's a third set here uh, of U US interventions or wars or so forth. Uh, some say uh, that's a that's I think was about 35 pretty good size conflicts that the US got involved in. Uh, there are historians who have totaled all this up and they say there's about 120 undeclared wars since 1941. US Constitution, Article One, Section Eight, to declare war, grant letters of mark and reprisal to make rules concerning the captures on land and sea. You need to go to Congress to get permission to do any of that stuff. So again, the last uh, congressional declaration of war officially at any rate was December 7th, 1941. That's 82 years ago uh, from uh, 2023. That's eight decades. Uh, presidents basically now declare war. Anti-constitutionalists use the argument that anytime Congress votes money to aid the president who is going to war, that means Congress has in effect declared war. So almost all these situations have had congressional financial approval. So to, uh, is it okay or isn't it? Uh, make up your own mind, I guess. Uh, presidents need power to declare war uh, due to nuclear weapons. Okay, what's that mean? Uh, some nuclear bomb goes off someplace. What, you're gonna the next day go to Congress and say, hey, a nuclear bomb went off. Can we send another nuclear bomb over there someplace? No. You got 20 minutes to respond or somebody says, hey, new, uh, rockets are headed this way. They'll be in the United States in 20 minutes. You don't have time to go to uh, uh, Congress and ask for a declaration of war. Uh, however, no nuclear weapons have been used since 1945. Okay, what about the war itself? This quasi false fake war. The French begin attacking uh, US ships. Now these aren't just United States government owned ships, they're very few, but they are ships uh, of corporations in the United States trading uh, as far away as India and uh, with European countries with uh, countries in the Caribbean. Most of these seizures uh, uh, occur in the uh, Caribbean Sea and uh, some of them even in US waters. Uh, an interpretation of this is, this is the United States government now taking military action supporting privately owned ships, corporations. Uh, and this is something that lots of people argue continues to this day. Lots of our wars uh, or interventions uh, deal with uh, defending US corporations. Uh, back in the 1950s, it was United Fruit and coffee companies throughout uh, Central America, there are people who argue that all these people coming out of Central America and wanting into the United States are fleeing from areas where 
it was the United States that created the difficulties there for people, low pay, et cetera, uh, by uh, defending those areas and setting up uh, uh, dictators in those areas so that life would be easier for coffee and uh, banana uh, growers. And, uh, well, this is no small matter. There's lots of privately owned ships. Uh, the first year, uh, almost one a day, 300 ships are, are attacked or they're told to get away or, you know, threateningly opposed to, in U.S. waters or in the Caribbean or ships we don't want near our country. Congress takes two actions. <clears throat> they change U.S. Uh, procedures to better respond to a crisis. Uh, now, there had been a Secretary of War, but there had been no Department of Navy. And in this day and age, lots of stuff was naval. Uh, that's how uh, trade was taking place. Uh, so. Uh, the United States says, Congress says, uh, we need a department of the Navy. Uh, the seas are where the action is at. Uh, it's how trade happens. So uh, a whole separate new uh, cabinet position is created. The Navy department combined uh, after World War II into the Department of Defense no longer the Department of War and the Department of Navy. And uh, Congress calls up a provisional army. Let's just have an army standing by, even though these difficulties are all on the sea. Uh, let's uh, uh, be careful and be prepared to protect land also. Uh, second to major action is uh, Convoys, uh, uh, let's, uh, a convoy is, you don't send a single ship out there. You send 10 ships all at once that sail close together and they provide a stronger looking arsenal and force against uh, a single French or British ship that might come upon American corporate ships. Uh, so, uh, convoys uh, are established, uh, and uh, some of them are established with Britain. Uh, let's join forces in this. So you get British and U.S. convoys, uh, and this, the hope is this will reduce losses, and it indeed does. Now, that Treaty of Alliance that we made in 1778, before there was a U.S. Constitution, it was with France that we are two countries that agree with each other and will defend each other. Now here we're involved in this quasi war with France. Okay, what happens? Uh, in the Caribbean Sea, these uh, French owned islands, well, we've agreed to defend those with this Treaty of Alliance uh, and we said we'd do that because thanks for the help during the American Revolution. Uh, take a look here. Uh, everything in blue type is um, French owned islands. Uh, many of the islands that you see in the dark uh, typeface are British owned. So you can see there are several French islands there in the Caribbean that. Uh, the United States has agreed with the Treaty of Alliance to defend. Well, this is 1778. 1789, the French Revolution begins. Uh, 1794, the French abolish slavery. Well, this drives the South crazy. The South has slaves. Now we have agreements with France and the South doesn't like the fact that France has abolished slavery. Uh, so what can 
Why should we be having agreements with slave free countries? Uh, this is a statue in France that uh, commemorates the age of slavery there. Uh, well, in the United States, and a lot of these southern states uh, in particular, but people in the north also are beginning to say uh, this 1778 Treaty of Alliance between the U.S. and France no longer exists. Uh, we made that agreement with uh, Louis the Sixteenth. He was beheaded in 1793. France has a whole different government now, so that that's null and void. Uh, question then becomes: Do treaties with foreign countries change when the country changes leadership? Well, uh, almost always no. Uh, the graphic here is Louis the Sixteenth uh, uh, at his execution. He was beheaded, seventeen ninety three. Okay, what was this thing about? This quasi war. Uh, by and large, it was about capturing each other's ships in the Caribbean, and it ended when Napoleon came to power. Napoleon didn't want to mess around with the Caribbean islands. He was conquering uh, North Africa, Egypt, you know, the Middle East. Uh, he was conquering other nations in Europe. Uh, he was setting up an empire that was uh, all joined together. Uh, so he was uh, amenable to having a new treaty. And that brings us to the Convention of 1800. Uh, this eased tensions that had uh, resulted and that we've discussed here between France and the United States. And this Convention of 1800, a treaty, had three major provisions. Uh, it ended the Treaty of Alliance, first off. We are no longer going to mutually defend each other. So this, it's been a mutual defense pact and uh, it, it's over. Secondly, guarantees free trade between France and the United States. So the two countries will continue to be trading partners, even though they're no longer uh, military defense partners. And uh, we want this war to end, this fake war. And that was one of the provisions of the Convention of 1800. This is over. We're going to leave each other's ships alone, etc. cetera. Uh, lots of uh, U.S. merchants were making demands on France. You took our ship. We want payment back for that ship you took. That ship had a crew on it that we were paying. We lost the crew. There are damages that you owe us for the loss of the crew, as well as the loss of the ship. Uh, and what about the cargo on board? We lost that also. So the uh, treaty doesn't deal with any of these private corporations and their losses. Uh, but less difficulties with France uh, helped, uh, this treaty helped a great deal in the Louisiana Purchase, which occurred in 1803, not under Adams, but under Jefferson. <clears throat> and you can see the area in white making up uh, several states or portions thereof, including a major chunk of Minnesota, is the Louisiana Purchase. Uh, there's a close-up of it, of that area. So uh, this really sets, uh, sets the stage for the Louisiana Purchase, which will come a few years later. But let's talk about um, what's going on with Louisiana now under Adams. Um, the area in brown on this map is the Allegheny Mountains. And US citizens 
have moved out of these 13 colonies, these 13 states, and they've moved west of the Allegheny Mountains. Uh, the number of U.S. citizens living outside the states in this western area is 7.4% of the total population. It's about 400,000 people. Who are those people? Who are they? Are they U.S. citizens? Are they citizens of some other area, some country? What about Native Americans out there, et cetera? Uh, Kentucky and Tennessee uh, were states, but they were west of the Allegheny Mountains. So people located there are U.S. citizens and they're living in U.S. territory. But over 7% of U.S. citizens are living in non-U.S. territory. So what happens to a United States citizen who moves into foreign territory. And there's gonna be four questions here that deal with Louisiana territory and what was this quasi war really about? Uh, do citizens living in foreign countries, do they deserve United States protection? Can we go into foreign countries because we have citizens living there? Third, what if uh, these citizens want to stay in this foreign territory? Do they, uh, should we make them renounce their citizenship in the United States? Uh, should we tell them you're no longer protected by us, even though you've been a citizen here? So uh, what is this in reality? Is it the United States saying, hey, we got U.S. citizens living in foreign territory, uh, so we can make claims on that foreign territory? Is it really the United States looking for reasons to uh, expand further westward, which was something that we did wanted to do from the founding of the nation onward? Uh, Etc. What do we do about all those difficulties? Well, under Adams, uh, we wanted access to the Mississippi River. This was it was a major trade route. New Orleans, at the south end of the Mississippi River, was a major port area. And again, more than seven percent of the U.S. population has moved into that area. And there's lots of French in the area. These are Creoles. Uh, they still, uh, uh, lots of people of French ancestry live in Louisiana. Uh, are they preparing a defense against us, defending our citizens who are living there? Uh, or some people were arguing, no, they're preparing an offense, not a defense. They're gonna attack us, uh, et cetera. Um, alien and sedition acts now end up uh, getting passed and they deal with this topic. Um, are we going to try to do something to keep uh, foreigners at bay? Uh, what about foreigners who are living in the United States? Uh, what do we do about those people? What if they're involved in what we consider to be suspicious activities? So Adams wants to stop all these problems out west, our citizens, their citizens, et cetera. The British have been blockading the port of New Orleans. They don't want us having access to the uh, Mississippi River. They certainly don't want the French out there. Uh, they don't want anybody getting supplies out. The Mississippi River goes almost to Canada, which is controlled uh, mostly by the British, although the French are in Quebec. Um, nobody really knows for sure where this river goes yet. And uh, so what's gonna happen? 
Uh, this Louisiana territory actually stretches up into Canada. Uh, even though we purchased it in 1803, we had to give up a portion of it to Canada. And Canada and Britain are at war uh, up in that area. And US citizens, again, moving into this Louisiana territory. <clears throat> so these are just basically all questions that are going to come up uh, over the next few decades, even. So what are the defining moments of uh, this Adams presidency so far? Uh, the XYZ affair and the quasi-war. Many historians say these are the most dominating moments in the entire political history of the United States. We're a new nation. We're not that old. We're just forming up. We're establishing rules. And these rules that got established become uh, pretty important throughout our history. Democrats under Jefferson, they want to side with France because France got rid of its monarchy. We want a democracy not a monarchy with an aristocracy. The Federalists under Adams are concerned about the French Revolution and how anti-religious it was. Uh, <clears throat> freedom of religion is part of the US Constitution. Federalists wanted that upheld. The French aren't upholding it <clears throat> in their country. Further, the Federalists, uh, are wondering who do we want to be aligned with in the future? Uh, France is involved in a revolution. We're not doing a lot of trade with them. And uh, the United States needs uh, Britain for trade, even though we just had a war with Britain, even though we've won our freedom from Britain. What we are uh, uh, concerned about is they're the big trade giant in the world. We don't want to give up that economic status. Uh, so Adams goes to Congress. He speaks to Congress. And he says uh, that he wants to uh, uh, increase the defensive posture of the United States. We need to be uh, at greater ready for warfare. And uh, in order to hopefully avoid war, let's send another peace commission to France. There was a series on TV about John Adams and it, uh, Paul Giamatti is pictured here in that uh, television series uh, playing John Adams on this graphic. So. Okay, let's talk more about the Alien and Sedition Acts, but it's not this kind of alien. It, we mean foreigners here. First of all, what are these acts? Uh, I want to go back for a second. Okay. Oops. Uh, there are uh, four acts. The Naturalization Act, that are included in these this uh, Alien and Sedition Acts. The Alien Friends Act, that expired in 1801. A lot of times Congress will pass an act and they'll say, this is good for 10 years and it has to be renegotiated with Congress. Yeah. Uh, the Alien Enemies Act, that is still in force. And the Sedition Act, and that expired in 1800. So what do these things what do these things mean? Uh, Democrats uh, canceled two of the acts. Uh, Virginia and Kentucky uh, declared uh, these some of these couple of these acts as being unconstitutional, and uh, uh, they used the states' rights argument. We can any any policies made by the U.S. government we can 
uh, say we don't agree with them. And it's, we don't have to agree with them because we have the state's rights not to. Okay, what's the content of these alien and sedition acts? They make it harder to become a citizen. Citizenship laws uh, prior to this act was you have to live here for five years and then you can become a citizen. And uh, these acts uh, moved, uh, this Alien and Sedition Act moved that uh, requirement up to 14 years. Uh, Non-citizens can be deported. If you're doing something we don't like, we can force you out of the country. Uh, had a, but uh, we couldn't uh, do that with children. So it applied only to people over 14 years of age. Another element here is uh, if you're a non-citizen and we think you're dangerous to the United States, we can place you in our prisons. It doesn't have to be uh, an export only option. And uh, people from a hostile nation may be imprisoned. Now, uh, executive order 9066 issued by Franklin Roosevelt uh, started the Japanese internment camps. And uh, here's a picture of one of these internment camps on the far right. You can see a train arriving and you can see people lined up and uh, greeting these new arrivals. Uh, and uh, Japanese were considered to be members or descent dissented from a hostile nation uh, as a result of World War I. So were Germans, but we didn't set up camps for Germans. Many were arrested, but released. Uh, you can't make false statements about the United States. If you do, that's against the law. Uh, this is a major concern in social media today. Uh, lots of false statements about the U.S. being made. Uh, both sides and, and politics in the country are arguing. Social media is doing this here. You can see this is something that started a long time ago, spread more easily now or more rapidly. So responses to these acts. Uh, it's going to make the United States a safer place. Uh, we're going to be able to control non-citizens, uh, foreigners who are here, and it's going to help prevent hostilities from abroad. Uh, five objections came from uh, the Democratic Party. Uh, this is voter suppression. Uh, you're telling people there are things they can't say, even if they are citizens. Uh, uh, this is, uh, you're, you're silencing voters, uh, and you're, what you're, what you're really doing is saying anybody opposed to federalist policies, and John Adams was a federalist, but anybody opposed to federalist policies, um, uh, is going to be an enemy. Uh, third item is, uh, uh, Laws are violated um, within the U.S. Kind of mentioned this already. Freedom of speech, for instance, uh, uh, and uh, immigrants are limited. And the reason uh, a lot of people gave uh, for the uh, Federalists not uh, or wanting this law passed is because Immigrants tend to decide with the Democrats at this time in our history. So if we can limit immigrants, that's better for the Federalist Party. And five, uh, newspapers were being prosecuted as a result of this act. Uh, some of the headlines that they would run, the stories that they would run, uh, Federalists were saying these are false statements. Uh, and, but the only uh, the Federalists only prosecuted uh, Democratic Party newspapers. Now, in this day and age, uh, 
newspapers took sides. So you might have the, uh, you know, the Red Wing Democrat. My wife's from a town, St. James, Minnesota, that's 40 miles uh, uh, west of Mankato. The St. James Plain Dealer indicating we're not going to take sides. Uh, and you get Republican and Federalist newspapers, et cetera. So newspapers uh, were indeed aligned with political parties. Okay, what are some citizen concerns? Uh, the US needs a revolution. We really didn't have a real revolution. The so-called revolution that we had in 1776 was really about economics and it was about the upper classes who owned the corporations in the United States versus those same people in England. So it was really about trade. It was about economics. Uh, Shays' Rebellion, which came later in the 1790s, and the Whiskey Rebellion were both put down by the U.S. government, but they were the true definition of a rebellion. They were citizens rising up against their existing government, Shays' Rebellion and the Whiskey Rebellion. Uh, prosecutions, let's take a look at uh, what happens here. Lots of people were prosecuted under the Alien and Sedition Acts, newspaper writers, uh, uh, verbal. Uh, so people who said things at rallies that were not liked by the Federalist. We're gonna take a look at six cases. Uh, these are uh, the individuals that we'll look at. First is uh, this man, B.F. Bakke. Uh, he was the editor of the Philadelphia Aurora uh, newspaper in Pennsylvania, and it was aligned with the Democratic Party. So the Federalists under John Adams did not like it. And uh, they accused uh, George Washington of um, uh, not properly handling federal money during his administration, and they ran articles about this. So uh, Bakke then accuses uh, John Adams of wanting to be king. Now, Adams was doing a lot of stuff like uh, uh, that was reflective of monarchies. Uh, he... Um, Told people, you know, people say, what do we call you, uh, Mr. President or what? And he said, no, call me your highness. So here's your highness. Uh, sounds royal in nature. And uh, uh, a lot of these Democratic newspapers then were opposed to uh, these things that sounded monarchical. Uh, Baki was arrested. He died before his trial. He was just 29 years old. The BF in his name stands for Benjamin Franklin, and he was one of Franklin's grandsons. Uh, second case is uh, Luther Baldwin. Now, Adams would make speeches uh, before live audiences, and uh, uh, Luther Baldwin was at one of those. Uh, speeches, and he was very drunk, and there was a gun was fired in the audience, but it was not Luther Baldwin that fired the gun, but he was interrupting Adams and uh, was uh, noticeably drunk, drunken. Baldwin then shouted out uh, when that gun went off, I hope it hit Adams in the arse. The arse, of course, meaning the lower back portion of the human body, uh, similar to the graphic that you see here. Baldwin, for uh, shouting out this remark, was fined $100. In uh, 2022 dollars, that's about 2,400 bucks. Uh, David Brown of Massachusetts, he set up a poll. And it had uh, statements on it, little flags on the pole. That was his crime. 
uh, no Stamp Act, no Sedition Act, no alien bills, uh, et cetera. Uh, long live the vice president, you know, that's a slam against uh, uh, Adams. Brown was arrested, his bail was set at $4,000. That's about $80,000 in uh, uh, today's money. Uh, he pled guilty to the charges. I did indeed say that. He was fined $480. That's about 10 grand in today's money. And he was sentenced to uh, 18 months in jail. Uh, James uh, Callinger, uh, he wrote a book called Adams a Hypocrite and an Oppressor, $200 fine. That's about $4,000 today and sentenced to nine months in prison. Uh, Anthony Haswell, uh, the Vermont Gazette was the newspaper that he published. And he wrote about the Benjamin Franklin Bakke case in his newspaper, siding with Bakke. And here's uh, Haswell's tombstone. You can see he lived to be 60 years old, roughly. He was fined $200, four grand in today's money, and he spent two months in jail. This is uh, Matthew Leon. He was a congressman from the state of Vermont, and that Vermont Journal, he wrote an article for it. And uh, he was very critical of Adams. He said, uh, Adams is full of pomp. He's full of foolishness. He's a selfish individual. And uh, he's the scourge of the aristocracy here in the United States. And he's fined $1,000. That's about $20,000 in today's uh, money. Spent four months in prison and then was allowed to return to Congress. He was a sitting congressman. So Jefferson, when he became president, of course, didn't like any of this stuff, which was perpetrated upon him and the Democrats by the Federalists and Adams. So he pardoned all of these people that had been convicted, not just these six, but everybody who had been charged or, and or convicted. And he repaid all their fines. 1804, the Supreme Court says, we can declare laws unconstitutional. Uh, that is an option that was not available during the Adams administration. So any, anybody saying, I want this to go to the Supreme Court, really didn't have an argument for declaring a law of Congress uh, null and void. So still in effect is this Alien Enemies Act. Uh, and uh, it involved uh, the uh, Executive Order 9066 that we discussed a bit earlier uh, that entoured Japanese people, uh, Japanese citizens and people of Japanese ancestry during World War II. 62% of all the people interred in these Japanese internment camps were U.S. citizens. Uh, uh, how, how are we doing, Judy, for time? Well, we've got about uh, 15 minutes left. It's 1.46, so we, uh, we can stop for questions. We do have a few questions in the Q&A line, uh, or we continue a little longer, but if this is a good stopping place, that sounds good to me. Okay. Do you want to uh, stop? Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, let's go to the Q&A uh, line then, and I will say to the audience, uh, we do have room for more questions in the Q&A line. So if you have a question that you uh, haven't asked yet, uh, type it in and I will read it to uh, JB. Uh, 
All right, the first question has to do with uh, the original title of this talk was Mr. Ambassador Adams and his young nation. This questioner says, I missed last week. Uh, we, will we hear about Adams ambassadorship uh, during an upcoming session? What, uh, what I, happened to the talk for today? Yeah, uh, well, I don't know if we'll hear about it or not. I can send you the slides. I can also send you the text portion. I'd like to, uh, uh, you know, I write up a text. So I've got like a hundred pages on Adams that's all text. Mm -hmm. And um, I can send that to you and you can read through it. Uh, the problem is uh, me calculating. And I thought five, uh, five classes on Adams would cover the material and it's mm -hmm. not happening. Uh, so I wanted to skip Tui's presidency today. So let's see how far we get next week. And I can try to go back and include some of that information. But um, at this point, I'd say, no, it's unlikely. We may not get that done. But no. have the material that can easily be emailed to you. And uh, let's mention that next week. And we can post my uh, email address so people mm -hmm. can write to me and I can okay. send that out. Okay, maybe we can have an Adams addendum to uh, your next series on Thomas Jefferson. What do you think? <laughs> well, yeah, I could uh, yeah. this fall, this fall, I could take a day and finish up that. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Um, moving on uh, to the next question. Uh, what U.S. diplomats negotiated the Treaty of 1800? Oh, that I the don't The treaty know. with France, I guess that is, right? Yeah, it was a convention of 1800. And mm -hmm. I don't know, but I'll write it down and look it up. Mm -hmm. So, sorry. And while we're on that question of the identity of, of uh, diplomats, why did the uh, French feel that it was necessary to assign initials X, Y, Z? Why couldn't they use their real names? Well, it was, uh, it was a very controversial thing to be doing. Uh -huh. We'll negotiate with you if you pay us money. They were uh -huh. asking the U.S. diplomats for a bribe from the uh -huh. U.S., and um, you mean it was a bribe to them individually or to the I thought it was to the French nation. Well, it could have been to either. Uh, mostly, oh, I see. OK. Yeah, mostly during this time, it uh, would have gone directly to Talleyrand. Oh, I didn't understand that. Well, yeah. no wonder they wanted to be anonymous in that case. Huh. Yeah. yeah. OK. Uh, next question. Has anyone written about the relations between Native Americans and the incoming uh, U.S. immigrants? Oh, yeah, there's uh, there are many books. I can't think of uh, one to recommend to you right now. But if you search the Internet about uh, Native Would Americans, you would you want to talk just a little bit about relations between the young American nation and the Native Americans uh, who predated us all, of course? Well, it was pretty much get out of the way. Mm -hmm. You know, it's what westward expansion was all about. What in U.S. history we call manifest destiny. We mm -hmm. want our nation to go from ocean to ocean. Everybody else get out of the way. And that included uh, uh, scores and scores of Native American uh, mm -hmm. groups. And uh, of course, uh, you know, it's the estimates are difficult about how many Native Americans there were in the present day US. Some people say as few as 20 million, some say 100 million. Mm -hmm. Now, today in the United States, there's about 750,000 Native yes. Americans. Mm -hmm. At the lowest figure possible, 20 million Native Americans at the time uh, that mm -hmm. uh, 
Europeans started to land here. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, uh, that's a tremendous genocide. Mm -hmm. well, okay. Um, next question. Uh, I thought laws were passed against gerrymandering years ago, and yet it is probably worse now than ever. Uh, it's the states that determine congressional districts. It's not the federal government. So, uh, were there ever a, laws passed a, a against it? Well, yeah, a state would have to pass a law <laughs> that mm -hmm. you can't gerrymander. And mm -hmm. then there'll be arguments about whether or not it's gerrymandering. And mm -hmm. who, who gets to decide what a congressional district is? Well, some places special committees are set up. Other places, the uh, state uh, representative bodies decide mm -hmm. it. Uh, how do you make it fair? Uh, do you throw a grid pattern down and expand it somehow? And, and of course, mm -hmm. today we just have endless amounts of information about mm -hmm. how each precinct votes, uh, how many people in this precinct, you know, it's 60% Democratic or something. So people deciding mm -hmm. how to make districts have lots of information in which they can... Mm -hmm. um, why are the Republicans so much better at gerrymandering since it since it is appears to be uh, able to be done since the legislatures get away with it? Why are the Republicans so much better at it than Democrats? Well, I don't know. I, I think the Democrats are good at it, too. They just aren't doing as much of it. And it may oh. be because they don't have to, you know, the the number of people who say I identify as a Republican, mm -hmm. I, I think it's about 30%, about 40% mm -hmm. say they identify as Democrats. So okay. you have a larger percentage of mm -hmm. the population. Mm -hmm. that, uh, and then another question about gerrymandering that's just come in. Why is gerrymandering not challenged on the basis of being unconstitutional as a poor representation of the people involved. And haven't certain gerrymandering plans been challenged, some successfully, some not? Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. And yeah, I don't know. I'm, I don't know about all of that. Uh, part of it mm -hmm. is states' rights stuff. Mm -hmm. Part of it is... Um, uh, in order to get to the Supreme Court, you need to um, uh, lose a case and then appeal it to a higher court. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the people losing the case say, okay, that's fine. We want it to stop here. Mm -hmm. uh, also, it's uh, uh, setting up congressional districts is a state right. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's a, and there are some states that have very little of it, like mm -hmm. Minnesota. We have one gerrymandered district. Uh, Mary Kiffmeyer is uh, blamed for it. And it basically goes all along the eastern suburbs of St. Paul from north, mm -hmm. north of um, Inver Grove Heights and then runs across the northern suburbs and then down to Lake Minnetonka. So it's kind of like an upside down U, but mm -hmm. those are all wealthy areas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, anyhow, it's, uh, uh, they're just, the fact that there's very little being done about it is a matter of, uh, mm -hmm the nature of the problem. 
Let's change the subject. Uh, you mentioned that the American Revolution wasn't a true revolution. It was a conflict between wealthy Americans versus wealthy British. Well, and then a few years later, in 1789, came the French Revolution, which was a true class revolution. So what was the attitude of the young American Republic to the very new uh, French Republic uh, that had been that was really a, a revolutionary state. W were they threatened by it? Did they identify with it? What was the attitude uh, here in the United States? The big attitude was monarchy, mm -hmm. and uh, a lot of people in the U.S. went were casting off the British monarchy, mm -hmm. and that's what they saw France doing. I see. Mm -hmm. uh, so that that was the consequence of it. But yeah, some people, me included, I prefer to call the American Revolution the War for Independence. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Um, here's an interesting question. I think we're probably going to have to end on this question. We're running out of time. Um, thank you, this person says, for excellent information. In your estimation, would John Adams be a good candidate for president today? Uh, a couple of reasons why he wouldn't, and they have nothing okay. to do with politics. He was short and fat. <laughs> yeah. And it's about image mm -hmm. for lots of people nowadays. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly his his political background was good, mm -hmm. you know, and he was, uh, a major problem he had was not speaking out on a lot of issues, slavery in particular, because he knew it was a very divisive issue. And mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, and, and that happens regularly today also. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a rags to riches guy. Uh, his uh, parents were laborers. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, he managed to become an attorney. And of course, that's become that rags to riches theme has become a very popular in the history of our country. Was part of his ab uh, opposition to slavery, his abolitionism, simply the fact that he had been born poor and that his family could not afford slaves? Was well, it no, perhaps they, economic? Oh, no. They they were, I think it was, it was mostly moral. And they were mm -hmm. from Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. uh, Northern, yeah. yeah, Northern state was not a slave mm -hmm. state. Sure, okay. All right. Well, we are out of questions um, and we're just about out of time. So I'm going to thank J.B. Anderson and thank you, uh, Grayson Simmons and Carmi Blyfus behind the scene. Thank you very much to our attentive audience. Please come back next week for our final program in this series when J.B. Anderson will continue further on the presidency and perhaps even the post-presidential years of John Adams. But for right now, we're going to say Thank you very much. Goodbye.